Um, hello, live stream again. Welcome back to the show. Uh, this is the last panel that I'll be introducing, but it's a real honor uh, to bring, and I hate to stand in front of them, um, but these are some of my colleagues from a, a research institution uh, that I'm affiliated with called Data and Society. Um, I was a former fellow there, um, and they helped kick off the, the workshops that we've been doing at Beta NYC and around open data. Uh, they were instrumental in giving us a space to experiment and to think about how elected officials in government um, could be trained about open data. So it's a real pleasure to have uh, those colleagues here. Um, this session is going to be on building anti-racist solidarity networks in technology. Um, and um, uh, it's going to be primarily moderated through Matali, and I'm going to let the panel then uh, um, go through and do the rest of the introductions because we've had a little bit of a change. Perfect. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for thank you for coming out in the snow. Um, we really appreciate you being here for our conversation. We are not going to do two things. We're not going to solve racism. And we're also um, not going to do magic. So those are the two things we're not doing. What we do hope to do, though, is to have just a little bit. What we do hope to do, um, my colleague Rico is setting the stage so that we are all protected and sound in this conversation. But what we are going to do is speak a little bit about ourselves, the work that we do, and the role that um, race and identity plays in our, in our lives in technology. So my name is Mitali Conde. I'm a fellow at Data and Society, um, the same fellowship that Noel was on. And my work really centers around developing federal tech policy for the for Silicon Valley. And I got into that absolutely by mistake through uh, looking at diversity and inclusion with a nonprofit called Black Girls Code, did some work with them um, as their Google liaison and, and really understood very quickly that the people that make decisions within technology companies are engineers. And many of those engineers do not even have that understand, don't, it's not really about lived experience, it's really more about not having an understanding of how structural and interpersonal racism impacts the lives of people of color, specifically anti-blackness. And so that became a real fascination in how technologies are built that became a conversation around, um, became a conversation uh, around Eth uh, ethical use of, and building of technology and design and bias and eventually became a much more robust conversation which I'm really pleased to say that Nancy Pelosi has taken on around how are we going to regulate these technologies so that they don't hit one kill us or number two give us the president of Indonesia as opposed to a president that we vote for. But that was all by mistake. And it was really despite me being black rather than because of me being black that I was able to make some of those career moves. So what I'm hoping in this conversation is that we can offer some windows and potentially put down some ladders for folks who are coming from minori minor minoritized spaces and then free up non-black people, non-people of color to really understand what it is to be an ally and to really understand what anti-racism can and should look like and then hopefully build community with the people in this room. So I am now officially the moderator. Oh God. And I'm echoing. I am now officially the moderator. If you want to speak to me more about my career or just hear more about me generally, find me afterwards because this conversation is really one that I'm putting across to my amazing, amazing colleagues. So the first thing I'm going to ask, starting at the end, um, Sorry, with... I want to give this to you, pass the note. Sorry, Mikali, I don't mean to No, 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 no. No, 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 no. it's cool. Um, actually, I'm going to switch up because I want you to talk about this first, Rico. So th what I'm now going to do is pass over the conversation and hope that we get into some of the issues that you have and we'll certainly have time for questions. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce my three colleagues. We are all from Data and Society Research Institute. The first is Rico Lera. I'm sorry. <laughs> Roberto? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, Jesse Daniels, uh, a Nitrajan Krishnaswamy. 
Okay, my name is Metallian Conde. So when I can't say names, that means no one can say names because <laughs> no one can say my name. So Rico, I'd really like to start with you. If you could just introduce yourself more fully and then set the stage for us. And then Jesse, on to you and then um, the same question. So um, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Mic check. Check, check, check. OK. Thank you, Mutale, for, is this good? Can you hear me? Yeah. This is better? Yeah. OK. Um, thank you, Mutale, for making that introduction and bringing us together for this panel. Um, you wanted us to start with kind of our origin story and laying that groundwork down. Um, what I've done here is created um, just an altar or, of some of my most sacred objects as a means, as an entry point to tell you, share with you who I am and what my origin is. Um, I am a first generation uh, college graduate originally born in central Mexico, raised in Ohlone territory, otherwise known as the San Francisco Bay Area, um, by ways of the Great Lakes region where I went to school, and now here in um, where the Hudson River diverges, uh, otherwise known as Manhattan or New York City. Um, I, my pathway to technology and to the, the, these kind of spaces, these kind of places, these kind of buildings, these kind of conversations, is not linear at all. I am actually very against uh, the language of pipelines, whether they're leaky or not. I don't want everyone to be placed in a pipeline. Don't put me through a pipeline. Don't talk to me about pipelines. I am adamantly against linear systems of um, constraining people of color, queer people of color, just to end up at institutions that are going to keep us very unsafe. And so what I've done here, because I always, I always walk around with medicine, I always walk around with protection, it's just set the stage for, for my own protection, but also for the protection of my colleagues and also um, for the protection, for protection of, of, of the audience. Now, what does that mean? What am I trying to do? These objects represent my origin. And all of them were gifts to me. And so instead of telling you who I am, I am showing you who I am. And these kind of exchanges and these kind of gift economies are exactly the kind of medicine that I am working on bringing, bringing into the technology space. So present here is a mazorca, which was gifted to me by my friend Roy Baisan. This comes from Puebla. Um, most Mexicans and indigenous people here in, in New York City are poblanos. Um, the raven feather belongs to my grandmother, and it was gifted to me by Sandy, who was her previous uh, crow. She's been raising crows ever since I was a child, teaching them to speak. The white sage is for protection, and the crystal is to cut through all the bullshit that we always tend to find in these kind of conversations around diversity and inclusion in places and institutions that uh, actually don't really want us here, but they just... Uh, um, pretend that they do. And so a lot of what I've been talking to Mutali about and Jesse and Atarashan is how do we want to show up when we are invited to spaces like this? How do we want to continue to be show up when we uh, actually do get uh, these jobs and these positions? And so I want to show up with medicine and I want our exchange to be reciprocal so that you're not just taking my story, and in fact, we establish uh, a line of trust within the time we have together to 
to make that exchange. So just setting, setting the, the tone here for, for the rest of our conversation. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. Um, that's really important, but I know that when I was at Google, if, if I had, um, if I turn up in such an authentic way, that might not have been safe for me. And I think that's something that we need to acknowledge in this space also. So Jesse, as you tell your origin story, um, certainly your personal origin story, but I would be really interested to find out how you got into technology and um, what, what a display of us showing up as ourselves, signals to white power structures, and maybe um, we'll get into more of a conversation, but I think that's a good start. Yeah, so um, thanks, Noel and um, Mutali, for inviting me here today. I just want to start out by saying that I, um, you know, I come from a family of uh, settler colonialists, and I, my family is on the wrong side of history. And, and part of the, uh, what I find meaning, uh, meaningful in my life is trying to uh, do some reckoning with that. And part of the way that I did that early on was um, I was in graduate school, you know, nothing happens by accident. I believe I had started a dissertation studying the Klan. This was back in the 80s and 90s, and so this was all in print um, publications. And I was midway through dissertation on studying the, the Klan, and quite by accident, um, pulled a book off a shelf and found that through a series of family connections that my grandfather on my father's side had been in the Klan. Um, and my family reacted in this sort of uh, blasé, um, what's the big deal? They were just trying to help people kind of way. And I was shaken to my core by that uh, revelation in my own family history, even though I was studying these groups. Um, and that led me to a personal reckoning in which I changed my, my given name and my family name. I was born Suzanne Harper. I changed my name to Jesse Daniels after Jesse Daniel Ames, who was an anti-racist activist in Texas which is where I'm from originally. Um, and she started something called the Association of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching. So my name change was really in honor of, of her work. Um, uh, I continue the work on white supremacy throughout my career, so I've been doing that about 25 years now. And, and part of that is what led me to this uh, interest in technology. There's another narrative there too. But, but what I watched happen in the white supremacist movement was that they were what I'm, what I'm calling uh, innovation opportunists. They saw the potential of the internet for their movement early on, well before any of us on the left really saw it, and, um, and, and, and jumped on that opportunity as they saw it with the internet. The other thing that was happening is I got my first uh, job as an academic. I'm a professor of sociology in my day job, and I'm, for this year I'm at Data and Society as a faculty fellow. Um, but in the late 1990s, I was teaching uh, for the first time on a tenure track job at a school on Long Island. And I took my students from a regular sociology, race, and ethnicity class into the computer lab. Um, and I had, this was before Google, so one dialed up Alta Vista probably, and the other one dialed up Netscape. Um, and two students, one of them typed in kkk.com and the other one typed in Martin Luther King, and they both ended up at white supremacist sites. And that experience led me to wonder how to study white supremacy online, and that became my second book, which is called Cyber Racism. Um, and so I feel like really my career and my adult life has been the, these sort of two um, uh, threads of, of studying racism and trying to deal with it on a really personal level and also uh, dealing with technology. It was soon after I had this experience in the lab at this university on Long Island um, that the guy who was the chair of my department at the time said, Jesse, why are you studying the internet? It's a fad. And besides, you're using it in the classroom and it's making the students cry. You've got to stop. And I said, I think I need to go somewhere else. <laughs> and I left academia and went to work in the dot-com world for a while. Um, and would probably still be there because I had a press pass and <laughs> got to play on the internet all day. Um, but you know, fortunately, again, I don't think things happen by accident. I got laid off and, and came back into academia and continue the work I'm doing there. Thank you. And Natarajan, if you wouldn't mind just giving us uh, your background and how you got into technology. Hi, I'm Natarajan Krishnaswamy. I'm a cis gay man. I'm Indian American Tamil. Uh, 
I was born in Ohio and grew up in the South. So that's given me kind of a, sure. I was uh, born in Ohio, grew up in South Carolina, and that was kind of an interesting place to observe American racial relations uh, from a, a situatedness that didn't really quite fit in the system. Uh, I got interested in technology actually as a second generation programmer. My father also programmed and my professionally and my mother uh, knows how to program. Uh, so I was very fortunate to be exposed to tech and get into tech uh, from a young age. Uh, I actually studied mathematics undergrad and surprisingly to pretty much everyone who knew me didn't go to grad school right afterwards. I caught the tail end of the dot-com boom and became a software developer. Uh, and that's one of the luckiest choices I've ever made. Uh, it would have been just such a drastic difference in, for example, earning potential and really drove home how much of personal circumstance is luck as opposed to effort. Um, and I've been at large tech companies ever since. Okay, excellent. So now that we understand how we got into tech and what we bring to tech, my next questions are really around identity and how it, um, the interplay between the identity that you show up with and then how are you intentionally anti-racist and break down some barriers that are um, put up for folks of color. So um, Rico, I'd love to start with you again. As a native immigrant queer man, can you really um, speak through potentially some of the, the barriers, like think of a vignette around barriers and how you've overcome that and how that's shown up for you um, in your work? Um, yeah, I, I realized that at the beginning I didn't really share how I got to this place, but I arrived in this conversation at this panel um, really through the art community. So my first engagement has, my, my, deep, my community is the art and technology space. Um, and that's how I started. I, I became very interested in the conversation around network societies, network communities, and how art and artists were addressing um, these issues. And so I attended a, a a conference called Radical Networks put on by our uh, friend Erica Kermani. And through that, um, I began working at, uh, at a place called iBeam, which uh, funds artists and technologists to create kind of symbiotic work. And then after that, now I'm, I'm at Data and Society, working primarily as a project manager. Um, so I never really identified myself as a technologist. Uh, I'm still very, very uncomfortable with that term. Um, part of me is very skeptical about that term, um, but I do ident identify as an artist and I identify as a person that holds space. And I was able to um, kind of infiltrate and innovate these spaces, which is something we've talked a lot about. Um, and the way I was, have been able to do that is actually by showing up by, as myself. Like, a lot of, of, of what, I've, um, what comes up for me and my colleagues is this idea that we have to um, erase who we are to be legible. That, to me, comes from a practice of assimilating into whiteness that I find very damaging. And so, <clears throat> as a first-generation college uh, graduate, being in that space in a predominantly white uh, school, I, I did a lot of damage to myself, a lot of emotional, spiritual damage. Can you, can you, I'm just thinking about skills building for the audience. Can you think about ways that you, strategies, communities that you built that, that kind of counteracted that a little bit? Yeah, so what I was arriving at is there's been a process over the last, um, couple of years since I've been working in technology. Because look, I'm a technologist. I'm a nerd. I love all these tools as much as you do. But I want to show up to this work, and I want to show up to my, to my desktop um, without forgetting where I come from. Like, 
and some of the, uh, the ways I've been able to mitigate how uncomfortable it is sometimes to show up as myself in predominantly white spaces. And look, it's not even just about white spaces, because there's a lot of people in color in technology. But often, I feel so isolated when I'm around folks of color who don't even recognize me, who cannot speak to me heart to heart because they're performing some other thing. And so building community has been the way I've been able to mitigate this, this, these kind of barriers and these gaps. And one of the things, um, and this is a question for you, Jesse, I know that when we think about, when we're having conversations around bias in AI, for example, or programmers, or whatever, you know, something hits some people at Google are building, I don't know, some technology that is gonna crush Indian women. Like, I don't know, something crazy. One of the things that I um, have always been really interested in your work is your ability to show up and use white privilege to allow those conversations to happen in a way that's potentially safer. So I was hoping that you might be able to describe to us, we know that it comes from your academic background, but what does that look like for people that might be interested in the audience? Yeah, I think the conversations that we've been having, you and I have been having at uh, Data and Society uh, around racial literacy is really important here. And I think that this concept of racial literacy, which is from several scholars, including Howard Stevenson, who just paid us a, a visit uh, recently, has to do with a kind of emotional intelligence and ability to engage um, what he calls racially stressful situations in a way that um, allows you to not freak out. And I think that part of what happens for white people, and there are lots of words for this, there's lots of language around this, some people talk about white fragility and other kinds of terms, but, but basically there's a stress response that white people get when race becomes a topic. And it's not only white people, other, other people experience this as well, but I, I am white and acknowledge it in my own experience. But I think that if, there, if there's anything that the whole move toward mindfulness could do for us, it's to sort of take a breath, relax, and have the conversation. And I think that's part of what needs to happen. I, I want to say something else to just anticipating sort of where we're going with this conversation. There's often discussion that the default assumption around race and technology is that what we need is more people of color in tech companies. And I, I think that's true. And I think that we place an undue burden on the people of color that we invite into those conversations because we're expecting them, we white people are expecting them to do the work of carrying race. This happens in academia too, so I'm well familiar with it, um, but that's not enough. We can do better and a, a racial literacy framework would have us examining those of us who carry whiteness and uh, that occupy that space in a company. Uh, it would have us examining the way whiteness makes a, a workplace alienating, right. and, and that is connected to other regimes of power. And I just want to say, well, tell one quick story from my experience when I was working in a tech company. Um, now, I, I showed up there as a, a cis white woman who was also the only out lesbian at this company. Now, there, there were lots of other lesbians hiding in the closets around, but they were not coming by my desk. The people who were coming by my desk were the straight cis men who were like, hey, can I show up at your apartment with a camera? I was like, what are you talking about? And I and another person there became uh, fast friends who was Cleveland, who was the only um, black person at that whole organization. And I don't know if I can tell the story without crying, but Cleveland was one of the first people who was laid off in that company. And we became such close friends, I actually married his sister-in-law, um, and, and after, they got close. After, he was, <laughs> after he was laid off, um, Cleveland, Cleveland didn't do well. He didn't get another job. Um, he ended up leaving his family, and the last I heard, he is on the streets and homeless. And after I got laid off from that tech company, even though I was there as a queer person, I was able to bounce back. And I went back into academia. I'm tenured and full professor now, but I think often of our diverging paths. And that is a racially stressful moment for me, but I have to remember that and honor Cleveland by talking about it with you all. 
and I think that's a reality. I really, uh, I personally really appreciate, and I hope everybody else really appreciates, Rico laying out and speaking about his heritage and sharing that with us, because that's an incredibly brave thing to do when you're thinking about speaking about technology because we are so oppressive. Thank you so much for that. And the Trajan, I would really be interested as someone who occupies a much more white friendly person of color, like you're not scary, you're not a super predator, you're not gonna like take somebody's bag. Um, and as an um, Indian queer man, I would really be interested in you speaking about how that shows up given that you do work for you know, probably one of the largest companies in the world and occupy a software engineering role, which is, you know, you're on the CEO track, potentially. I think I'm never gonna be a manager, but uh, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that's an uh, accurate observation. I uh, started working at a time when queerness became a lot more legible in large corporations. Uh, there was a diversity employee network group at IBM when I started there in 98, and uh, I'm actually still friends with a lot of people from that. So there was peer support, there was uh, like formal corporate support. Uh, and it's interesting in that the Techniques that we learned for peer support seem like good ones for uh, lifting up people of other underrepresented minorities. Uh, stuff like uh, focused mentoring, stuff like uh, just having an ear when one is needed, knowing who you can talk to that's safe. Uh, yeah. I kind of got interested in racial justice through feminism. I had a rather radical feminist friend after college, and it really, the perspective really opened my eyes as to how power and oppression actually work. And you can't unsee after that. So uh, it's like that's kind of what led to my uh, volunteering and my interest in, I, I, sorry to use the phrase, the. Uh, leaky pipeline discussions. I don't like that phrase because it suggests that the problem isn't in hiring and promoting and retaining uh, white women and people of color. Uh, it's uh, the retention also, I think, is that I'm grateful to Jesse and Mutale for their conversations around racial literacy. Is that it seems like a skills-based approach, a, a technology, if you will, for uh, reducing the amount of stress that uh, particularly black people in technology face uh, for being the only ones, for being the first, and all the pressure that goes along with that. And so as we're coming to the end of the discussion, one of the things that I want us to do is to turn to much more of kind of practical, if I'm interested in this, how do I get into it? How do I carry on with the work discussion? And the one thing I want to really acknowledge is the only black person on the um, panel is thank you for showing up and thank you for showing up. That makes me feel good. Because those, and the reason that I point out those two people is that when I go into rooms, that's the reality of what I face. I'm often the only one and then I have to speak for everybody and I can only really speak for myself. That's very stressful. Um, much like Lynn Patton at the Cohen hearings, um, Trump's black friend who, sh who showed up to say that he's not racist. Um, I often don't do that, just, just in case you're wondering. But um, it's kind of turning that corner, I've always been very, very fascinated by this idea of being given windows to what I can do, but also being given a ladder to get to where I need to go. So uh, one of the things that I'm thinking, specifically from an arts perspective, Rico, can you um, describe any communities that exist in New York City or, and like I feel terrible now because I was totally going to talk about pipelines like all the time, <laughs> um, but in our pre-interviews I clearly didn't listen. Um, can you think about any pathways that people, to use your term, can, can um, infiltrate to, to innovate? Pathways. I don't know, yo. 
I, I struggle with this a lot because, like, I want to be real with y'all and how I show up to these spaces. But at the same time, to respond to what has been said, you know, I come from a critical race theory background. Um, that's, that was my academic training. I'm a historian. I left academia for other reasons. Um, and I, I found a lot of freedom in the art community because I could navigate that space in a way that felt authentic. But one of the things I struggle with in showing up to spaces in technology is, am I doing a disservice? Because my ancestors and our ancestors got really good at code switching, at transformation, at changing skins. These are the technologies that we came up with to survive in very hostile spaces. And so for me, thinking about pathways, I want to, one, I want to acknowledge the fact that I, I wanted to call this panel, I wanted to, very, to, to use the word anti-racist in a very strategic, purposeful way. Why? Because we need to ground this work uh, by addressing anti-blackness, and in particular, in the Chicano Latinx community, uh, anti-blackness is rampant. And the artist community is rampant. So that shit is, is present. And the pathway that I would, would recommend that I have been working on myself, the way that you and I have been building, is actually centering blackness in the work. And not only, uh, not only letting black folks say that, but I need to say that because you know what? I need to acknowledge the fact that I am, am a white passing man, cis men. I don't feel that way, that's not who I am, but that's how I'm perceived. Are there any specific organizations or networks for similarly situated people that they could find you to join you in this? I, I did make a, a list of people who I want to uplift, and the f I, I brought the feather in particular because we talk about uh, amplifying each other. That's really important. I prefer the word uplift. Um, and there are a couple people that I want to uplift here today. Uh, these are all friends of mine. American Artist is doing a great work around policing. Uh, Nabil Hassin is also doing great work around um, kind of abolitionist frameworks in, 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 in the carceral state. Taeyun Choi is doing great work at SFPC uh, with the Distributed Web of Care Project. My homegirls from Bufu are doing amazing work around developing a code of ethics for the internet. Uh, my friend Morrison Alighieri, Iranian artist, doing amazing work around digital colonialism, which is a whole other conversation. Stephanie Dinkins, who is also a fellow with y'all at Data and Society, shout out to her, doing a lot of work around community AI. And uh, finally, one thing I would leave you with in the conversation around artificial intelligence, I highly, highly recommend you check out Karen Howe's work. She uh, puts out an, a newsletter called The Algorithm, uh, coming out of MIT. Brilliant newsletter. Uh, and the last one that just came out on Friday, I want to highlight that, highlight that in particular because she talks about MIT's um, recent college that they, they're about to open or that they just opened, which the whole mission of which is to marry the humanities and STEM. So I really want to shout that out because as a person coming kind of from more of the humanities camp, it's, it's rough being in a STEM space and being like, uh, you're, you're just not taken seriously. But what we are discovering, what we are finding out, yo, and if MIT is addressing this, like, you know it's legitimate in this, tech, in this space, maybe, <laughs> but at least they pretend. And so I'm, as an interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary artist, I'm not only interested in working with artists, I'm, I want to work across the board because What's hot and most exciting right now in the tech space is how it's in conversation with other disciplines. That's really helpful. And we'll make sure that Noel has a list of those artists and those projects and then can be distributed afterwards. So, Jesse, I am not a white woman. Um, oh, is that right? <laughs> but I love, if you I love are, that about you. <laughs> but if you are a white woman who's interested in anti-racism and maybe you're in a meeting and maybe something is said that does not feel right, but you don't know 
how to respond. You also don't need to be in the way of fire. Um, I don't know if there's a white women who hate racism organization. Like I said, I'm not part of that club. Not yet. But how can people, like quick strategies, how can people show up in those moments but still maintain a level of safety for themselves because they are at jeopardy also? Yeah, I mean, I think that my main message is um, this word reckoning. You know, I think that we um, have to reckon with the spaces that we're in. And the thing that I would encourage white women, white people to do is like read the rooms that you're in, like look around at who else is in the spaces that you occupy on a daily basis. Are those predominantly white spaces? And are you choosing to be part of predominantly white spaces? And if so, what's your role in that? And how can you start to dismantle that? In terms of the conversational thing, I think that one of the one of the places that we can begin to start paying attention to is the kind of language that we use. My, my personal goal is that we um, start to get rid of certain phrases in 2019, like, I don't know, cracking the whip and holding somebody's feet to the fire. You know, think about that kind of language. Those are, that's language that's rooted in racial violence. And if your workplace is someplace that supports that kind of thing, oh, one I've heard in my workplace, we're going to circle the wagons and people are off the reservation. Yo. It's like... Powwows? Can we get rid of powwows? Like so, just I, and that's not about being PC. That's about saying this is language that's harmful, and it speaks to a kind of culture in the workplace. So I think it's it's valuable to be a white person in those spaces that speaks up about that. But I think the the bigger issue, rather than what's said in meetings that are all white people, is why am I in a room with all white people that's making these decisions, and and how do I work to change that? And, and just to ask you another question, because it came up, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about pitching ideas and random person of color pitches an idea, random white man pitches same idea, nobody listens to random person of color, often me. They're like, to Bob, they think it's the best thing that they've yeah. ever heard in life. Like, what happens then? That's when I'm like, yeah, that's the, there's, a, there's a name for this strategy, and I'm, I apologize, I can't remember, maybe someone in the audience knows, but, you, but basically what you're doing is you're, when you see a woman of color or uh, someone else in the room that's being ignored in that particular way, you amplify their voice. You repeat it and say, well, as Mutali said, what's it called? Shine. Shine. Thank you very much. Yeah, so that's what you do is you, when you see the dynamic play out, you can intervene. And, and not intervening is basically being a bystander. We talk a lot about those bystander trainings, but it's happening in the workplace all the time where, where people's ideas are being ignored. So I guess my other takeaway is, you know, listen to black women. And I should just shout out the work of Sophia Noble, who's done that wonderful book, Algorithms of Oppression, and Ruha Benjamin, who has a new book coming out. The title is not clear yet. I think it's going to be the new Jim Code. We don't know. Tend to do. You should it's going to be great, like, we'll, though. We'll let you know. Yeah. Can you get a mic? I kind of could have been on this panel. Um, I'm a technologist. I've been in technology since 1987, right? And um, what got me into it was that I was fortunate to study electronics in high school. And I went to an undergraduate school at a National Society of Black Engineers. And that served as a support group. But here I am, here is 2019, and I'm the only black man here, OK? So um, that said, one thing I want to say in terms of language is that right now there's a push for STEM, right? I work in education now. I do data science work, data analytics work, and education. And the thing that I'm aware of is that there's a push for women in STEM, right? And in terms of language, every now and then you would hear someone say underrepresented people in STEM, which changes the landscape when you start thinking about pushing for underrepresented people in STEM, right? It's a much broader stroke. So just in terms of language, Instead of just pushing for more women in STEM, and I love having women around, but also think about underrepresented individuals in STEM. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we will have time for questions. I promise you I have one more question, and then we're going to open it up. Um, Natarajan, one of the things that I'm very curious about um, are people of color who do not scare white people as much. And um, they do scare. like. 
don't, don't get it twisted, but you ain't white. <laughs> don't get it twisted. But there is there, could you um, kind of speak to holding that space? Because I think one of the things that you do really, really graciously and really, really beautifully is uh, be an ally, be a non-white ally, because you're assumed smarter, you're assumed more able, um, than, than many of us that are, that many of us that face anti-blackness. And then to your point around underrepresented people, it, underrepresented people, we of, we often speak about black tech spaces, and then all minorities show up. And I don't know that I'm a hundred percent comfortable with everybody having to have this one massive tent. Even though we are here for you, when the war breaks out, I'm expecting you all to enlist so that we can fight for justice. But um, I, I myself recognize that that can, that can be reductive. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, one of the biggest things that uh, as an ally with more positional power, with more uh, legibility in some ways, I guess. The biggest things I can do is to give up some of my space. So uh, that's kind of ironic to say sitting on the panel, but uh, <laughs> um, in, in meetings, in making sure that uh, voices that wouldn't get heard, particularly black voices, get uh, attention. That, uh, in my volunteer work, I tend to do, I guess, racial justice adjacent topics. I've worked on uh, eviction and more recently some criminal justice reform. And just so that we don't miss that point, would you mind uh, speaking a little bit more about how you use your technical skills for justice? Um, I think it's important to avoid the uh, hackathon problem of making a demo that is then just put, on, put in the closet, put in the shelf. Uh, to make tech useful to other kinds of organizations, organizations doing good work, uh, it really has to increase their capacity. The people that you're working with have to be centered. The people that you're working with are the subject matter experts. Uh, so it needs to be from a kind of place of kind of humility or service orientation and definitely collaboration instead of, like, you're not the... Prometheus bringing the data science fire to the heathens or anything like that. Circling that wagon. <laughs> Just trying to see how many metaphors I could mix at once. And one organization I'd like to shout out who's in the room is the Center for Core in Innovation, where they, they ooh, do ooh. work with young people that are impacted by the problem. And I think sometimes in technology we speak about uh, groups of people without going in and mining that brilliance and mining that talent and bringing them in. So we're at around 15, the 15 minute mark. I would love if you guys are open to open up for um, questions and if you can ask any of us. And then after the question and answer session, there's a lunch session and we want to make it a working session. So for, if you do, can I just finish quick, really quickly with this and then, so if you are interested, you do not have to, and I was completely joking about the signing up for the war for justice, like not really, but you don't actually have to. If you want to get your lunch and then come back, and then we, one of the things we want to do is figure out who you guys are and figure out what brought you into this room and then figure out before we leave after lunch if there's information that we need to exchange. Um, Rico is amazing for holding gatherings and spaces. So we just had one last Wednesday where a bunch of people who are really thinking about developing an ecosystem that, that is um, anti-racist in its basis are, if you want to be part of that madness, then please come back after lunch and we can figure out how to get you on our email list. So and we'll we'll turn off the live stream. So it'll, yeah, it'll and we'll turn off the live stream. Like your boss isn't going to see it. Nobody like totally nobody will know it was you. Um, and and so with that being said, uh, I would love to open up the floor for questions. Okay.
Um, can uh, so just a few things. Actually, we can try to set aside Hudson uh, Yards with a boardroom that's right over here uh, for that conversation. Um, so I will make sure that we communicate that. Um, for those of you who want to ask questions anonymously um, and don't want to have your voice uh, on the live stream, uh, feel free to go to s l i dot d o and then n y c so data and you can ask the question there. Fatima is looking at those questions and she'll be able to lift those voices up. Otherwise, feel free to raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone over. Thank you so much for this brilliant panel, really. My name is Mona Sloan. I'm a sociologist at NYU Institute for Public Knowledge. Um, I just want to quickly say that Sasha Costanza Chalk at MIT does brilliant work on uh, design justice. So check out um, the Design Justice Principles, the Design Justice Network. Two quick questions, which might sound big. One, when we think about um, racism and tech and we think about racism and data, maybe we need to think about classification and think about the language of mathematics and statistics and I wonder how we can ever tackle that. One, and the second question is, how can we work towards sort of strategies that are available to everybody, especially the privileged, of critically locating themselves in the spaces that they're in um, to take away the burden from minorities uh, and so on, and how can we do that sort of urgently? So Natarajan, do you want to take math and do you want to take sociology, Jesse? Yeah, I think you made a very good point about classification systems and the uh, perceived neutrality of tech. There are still people today who will say that, oh, it's an algorithm, it can't be biased, despite, I guess, a couple of years at this point of reporting and research work. And uh, one of the, uh, I guess, one way to push back against that is with specific counterexamples. Uh, Boston had, I forget what it was called, Street Bump, I think, uh, is their program for crowdsourcing pothole locations. When this first started, that means people with smartphones get to report potholes and everyone else has to drive over them. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm told there have been some improvements to the program since then, but uh, uh, it's, I think the idea of a socio-technical system of the data coming in from a larger social process uh, with its own histories of injustices uh, entering the data from that perspective uh, or from that avenue uh, is something that does get through to a lot of technologists once it's posed to them. Um, was there something else you wanted me to address in that? or? So if we contextualize sort of what we're doing here, which is telling the stories of our origins and, and telling our stories through objects and so on, I wonder if that's maybe the kind of, kind of conversation we should be having and instead of maybe more and more conversations that are grounded in ones and zeros, if I want to polarize that a little bit. Can we ever get the complexity of social life into data? Yeah, I think that's a really good uh, way to put it. Uh, humanizing the data, uh, making sure that people's stories don't get lost in the transition to technical systems. Yeah, and I, I think it's a real challenge for people to, to talk about identity in, when they're talking about systems. I mean, one of the, um, you know, as we learned at this conference recently, one of the core principles of computer science is about abstraction, right? And, it, and, and talking about identity is really the opposite of that. So I think there's this kind of inherent um, kind of theoretical tension between these two domain assumptions. And I, I think that's the thing that has to be resolved in, in a way. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, y'all. Um, good to see y'all again. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be that person who does the it's, it's more of a comment, really, and I'm really sorry because I hate those. Go things. for it. Go for it. Comments. It's called question time, not comment time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's it's one uh, strategy to to echo off of what Jesse was talking about earlier. Um, that you would ask the question about like how do we interrupt those moments of tension. Um, and then a, a question that I'll need to contextualize a little bit. So one of the strategies, and I think. Um, Framing this as like building anti-racist practice in tech, 
um, is both really important to frame it as in tech and also can be misleading because it's building anti-racist solidarity as your personal practice. Right, it, it follows you in all in all spaces. Um, so one of the ways that, um, and I think there's this really great graphic out that's like, it's like an iceberg, right? And then the tip of the iceberg is all of this explicit racism that people are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that just happened. Um, and then everything else is all the stuff that you hear all the time every day that you let slide, and that's called the implicit racism, and that's the un and that's the stuff where someone's just like, you know, they just they value different things and you let it slide. Um, and so, but you know, you recognize it, right? And so when we as non-black people, um, so that means white people, that means East Asians, that means South Asians, that means everybody who benefits from proximity to whiteness, um, when we hear those things, our responsibility is to play dumb and to require people saying it to explain what they mean and make it explicit. Yes. Tell them all, email them, yes. Yes, so someone says, it's a different value system, and you're like, what do you mean? What is the, what is the different value? Well, well they, don't, they don't really value education. How do you know that? You have to keep pushing, you have to play dumb, because racism relies on the unexpressed to keep thriving. Um, so especially when you are that one person in the room and you're like, I don't know if I wanna start this fight, you're not starting a fight, you're asking to be educated. And in the education, exposes the racism. Um, so that is a strategy for everybody. Can I, uh, can I yeah. just add yeah. one tiny point right there? When this happens to me, and it's another white person, I often use the line, feel free to adopt this if you're white. I don't want to be white with you today. <laughs> yeah, she, she totally does. I didn't know what Mike to do drop. the first time. I was Mike like, drop. Sorry. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. We allow Please these proceed. comments. Please strike from the record <laughs> live stream. <laughs> um, and the, the second question goes back to the, what, I, what I mentioned about us folks with proximity to whiteness. Um, so a lot of what happens, especially in tech, is, is now we're getting these numbers of, well, we have diversity. We have all these people of color, right? And it's East Asians, South Asians, folks who um, have been fully indoctrinated into this model minority uh, assimilation model um, and are equally locked out of anti-racist conversation by virtue of being, um, or locked out of anti-racist education, as well as locked into being used as weapons against uh, black, Latinx, and indigenous people, right? So we're, we're in this awful position of like, we're close to whiteness and we're, not quite people of color enough, um, so we're weaponized in both directions. Um, so for each of you, if you could identify um, what are the things that you want to see folks like us, these proximal white people, um, be doing in our daily practice to make things better for folks like you. Um, and so Nataraj and I know that you know, we're, we're occupying similar spaces here, um, but if there are strategies that you think about, um, and I think you talked about this a little bit before, but um, yeah, you could elaborate on some of those. Hmm. What's up? Oh, question for everybody, okay. Uh, we have five minutes, so. Um, yeah, one of the big things, uh, like I said, is to actually make space. I liked the, uh, what was it called, Shine? The amplification? Shine. Yeah. Uh, and th that, that suggestion is wonderful, to play dumb. Uh, yeah, these, giving them catchy names seems like it might make them more memorable in the moment. So. I want to move away from allyship and talk about an accomplice, accomplice ship. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What does that mean? An accomplice is someone that is willing to sacrifice something. That something can be time, social capital, real capital, something of value that will actually uh, feel like a sacrifice. Because often allyship comes at no expense of the ally and all the expense of the person you're trying to help. What does that look like in the workplace? The reason Mutali and I have been building together is because we've actually established a real relationship through the workplace. Like, I've gotten to see you outside maybe, I don't even know, maybe never? Maybe this is the first time? 
Um, I know Mutale. I've, I have spent time with your two boys. I know your children. I know where you come from. So what does it look like to invest yourself both in a caring kind of situation, but also be willing to put up a sacrifice? Uh, that's a very difficult conversation because we are conditioned to be uh, only focused on our individual career growth. And I'm not uh, really about that. I mean, as, as an organizer, I understand that this there's a level of sacrifice. This is live stream. Data and society, he is about that. He loves his job. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love my job. <laughs> no, but I'm trying to be real because, like, we only get to spend so much time with each other and... How you show up is really, uh, is really transparent. Like. So just because we have not very much time left, um, Jesse, do you want to? No. OK. And then there was a guy in the back. Do you want to be the last question? OK. So um, how, what do I want? I want support. I want real support. If I ask you a question, it's because I've thought really hard about that question. So I'm in a situation right now where I'm trying to make um, a career move and the one person, well, not the one person. First of all, I only ask because they have proximity to the place is avoiding me. And I had to go up to him and say, dude, you clearly do not want to help me out. But the thing about me is that I'm a daughter of Harriet. One way or the other, this is going to get done. And I will remember when you didn't help me. And I will definitely enact revenge, because I'm petty. So what I need is for just help. And if you cannot help, and if that's fearful for you, be honest about that. Because you may honestly think that you're losing something, but the truth of it is, the pie only gets bigger. It never, ever gets smaller. Mm. And if we could just ground, if, if that could just be the basis, I think that we would all have a much more just technical space. We would have better technologies and better systems. But, but I want to give you the opportunity to ask your question, because we have like one minute. OK. Um, so how do I condense this? OK. So um, we've seen the oppression of South Asian immigrant workers in tech. And um, Microsoft and Google have in two Indian CEOs. Apple is working with like police departments to develop technology. Amazon is contracting with ICE. Microsoft and Google have been found to be um, working with the Department of Defense to develop drone technology to bomb uh, a bunch of countries. So my question really is, is anti-racist solidarity um, confined to identities, or does it, can it be expanded into active fighting against the fucked up shit that all of the capital... So I'm just going to respond really does. quickly. Yeah. Um, Anti-racism is about people. So, oh, sh whoa. Finish, yeah, uh, finish your thought. You can answer the question. Yeah. Racism is about people, so there is going to be, uh, we need to mobilize people. So I would suggest that anti-racism has to start with a humanities pr um, proposition. However, what I think you're really speaking about is revolution and organizing. And one of the things that I have been so excited about is to see tech workers really think about themselves with a labor frame and push back. And, and a counter question that we could speak about afterwards or whenever um, would be how can people that are not in those companies show solidarity to those movements? I think that that's a really interesting and exciting um, proposition. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be able to have my colleagues from Data and Society here support uh, and talk about these things. Uh, we were at uh, Data for Black Lives up in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, you know, there, were, there were some thoughts that I had that were really conflicting in, in the fact that you know, surveillance technology is controversial at the same time period, um, like when it gets fixed, 
that just means that we're more surveilled. And, and so I'm so glad that you were able to, the four of you were able to come on the snowy day and, and, and have the panel. Um, so let's talk about just a little bit of how we're going to deal with the follow-up conversation. So um, those of you who are interested, how many, just to take a, a, a just to take a count of hands. For, Okay, good. So what I'm going to do is that we're going to go for lunch. So lunch is going to be served in the cafe space. Hudson Yards is, as if you're walking down this long hall, is the long boardroom that's there. I'm going to kick everybody out of that room and set it aside for the follow-up conversation. It's an hour long. Uh, you have an hour, so uh, let me try to be as judicious as possible to get them out and then get you in. Um, and then you have the hour and just be respectful for the fact that that room then needs to turn over for the next space. So thank you very much. Um, For those of you on the live stream, we'll be back in an hour. So see you in an hour. Thank you. <laughs>